Well, thank you all for uh, greeting one another. I always have trouble getting you back because uh, you enjoy each other so much. Um, but if you got your Bibles, turn your Bibles to Genesis uh, chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. Uh, as you're turning, uh, we are going through a study on how you come to know and do the will of God and experience experiencing God. We all want an experience from God. And this is, we've been talking about how the Bible lays out the process by which we come to know and experience God. The first Sunday we talked about God is at work in the world. He's always at work. He will always continue to be at work. And when Jesus comes back, uh, he's going to take up uh, the bride, but he's still going to be at work in the world. So God is always at work. Now here's where, where we talked about. We talked about the problem with us as believers is we get real self-centered even about God's will. And we want to say, God, what is your will for my life? In fact, I have, a, I have a cute little story I tell. I have a brother named Will who's a pastor, and his wife says, this is God's will for my life. <laughs> um, but that's not the right question. The right question isn't, God, what's your will for me? But the right question is, God, what's your will? And I'll do it. Whatever you see God doing, he wants you to join him in what he's doing. And so we get very self-centered, and God wants us to focus on being more God-centered. And that's the first way you can do it. God, what's your will? And I'll join you. The second thing we talked about is that God pursues a love relationship that's real and personal. He doesn't want you to have a religion. He wants you to have a relationship, not just a relationship, a love relationship. And this is where trust comes in because you have to count that whatever God does in your life is an expression of love because the Bible says God is love. And so even when he has disciplined you, he's loving you as a father. That's what the Bible says. So uh, God is love. He pursues a love relationship with you that's real and personal. Sometimes we don't trust that God is love. And, and so we have trouble having faith. The next thing we see is that God invites us to become involved with the world. In other words, whatever God's doing, he wants his people to join him. And he will speak to you. God speaks through the Bible, through the prayer, through circumstances in the church to reveal himself and his will and his ways. For two Sundays, we've been talking about how God speaks. And this Sunday, here's what happens. When God speaks to you, like when Jesus went to his disciples and said, hey, take, a, take up your nets. Uh, he said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And what did they have to do? They had to actually drop their nets. They had to stand up, and they had to follow Jesus. So whenever God speaks to you, he will lead you to a crisis of belief that involves faith and action. It happens every Sunday. I just talked to a young man and never thought he would teach in his life. But I told him, he taught last Sunday here in our church, and I told him that you may not see you as a teacher, but God does. And that's going to lead all of us to a crisis of belief when we say, well, I can't. And God says, I know you can't. That's why you have to rely on me. You know, that's what he says. He's not concerned about your ability. He's concerned about your what? Availability. He wants you to be available to him. And so sometimes, uh, and, and Pastor Michael talked about this last week, sometimes God whispers through pleasure, but he shouts through pain. And the thing that I want to talk about before Brian comes up, Brian's going to come up and share his testimony. And, uh, and it's going to be a time when I want you to listen very carefully to how God moved in Brian's life. Uh, and I want to talk a minute about Brian before you come up, 
kind of do an introduction. Uh, Brian's a dear friend of mine. Um, we've just kind of constantly interacted with each other along the years. We found ourselves in the same places. And it's just been very uh, a joy of my life to know uh, my brother Brian. And so he's going to come and share his testimony with you. But before, let's look at God's Word. This scripture verse means a great deal to me. Genesis chapter 50. And I'm going to read to set the table um, with verse 15. What we find in Genesis is that Jacob has died. Jacob is called Israel. He had 12 sons. He is the son of God's promise. And near the end uh, of, it starts in Genesis chapter 37, um, God's, uh, the, the children of Israel, 11 of them, sold uh, one of them, or 10 of them, sold one of them into slavery. Sold their brother into slavery. And now in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph, who is the favored son of Jacob, his father has died, and the, the, the sons of Israel aren't sure if Joseph is going to be merciful to them. Maybe he'll exact judgment on them. And this is what, uh, start with me in verse 15. It should be up on the screen. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Not only, it didn't start with them selling them into slavery, none of them wanted to kill him. But one of them, Reuben, said, no, let's not kill him. Let's throw him into a pit. And then they sold him into slavery. Could you imagine could you imagine your family selling you into slavery? They didn't know what kind of life he's going to be in. They just didn't care. They sold him into slavery. So they went, so they sent messengers, verse 16, to Joseph saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. What is interesting about this passage, it almost sounds like they're still conniving. Did, did, their, did their dad really say that? We don't know. What the Bible says is they, they say to Joseph. So going on to verse 18, uh, or the rest of that verse. Now the servants of God, your father, and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Verse 18. And his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. This is a dream that Joseph had when he was a young boy. He told his brothers, I had a dream and I was standing and you fell before me. And they became angry at him because he thought he was better than they were. But he was just sharing a dream that God had given him. And this is indeed the dream that was fulfilled. In verse 19, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? It's so important to remember that. Am I in the place of God? What's the answer? No. no. I'm not in the place of God. Who am I to exact judgment on you? Am I in the place of God? And then he goes on to say, um, But as for you, you meant evil, but God, evil against me, but God meant it for good. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save the many people. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you 
and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Let me say a word of prayer. Father, moments that we have together, I ask you to speak to us. Let us know that you don't waste one hurt in our life. Let us know that you want us to have a love relationship that's real and that's personal. Help us to realize that we're not God. You are God and we are not. And Father, when you speak to us, you often lead us to a point of decision, a crisis point. The word crisis comes from the word cross. And we, when we come to the cross, when we come to uh, crossroads, we have to make a choice. We have to make a decision. One man trusted you. The other man rejected you. Which side of the cross are we going to be on? But Lord, you lead us so often into these places where we come to the end of ourselves so we can get to the beginning of you. And Father, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. I pray that you will let us know how you're speaking to us, that it is you who is speaking, and you make it clear what you are saying. And Lord, that, that you are leading us to make a major adjustment in our life. We have to trust you and we have to obey you. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth, not only mine, but Brian, and the meditation of my heart, not only mine, but Brian, will be acceptable to you, O oh God, our, our Savior and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, uh, I've gone through some hard times. I'm not the only one, am I? Have you gone through some hard times? Some of our own making. Some we didn't even have anything to do with. Those are the hardest ones when you don't know, you know, you had no control over it. And sometimes we're like this. There's a, I have a piece of puzzle I want you to see. It's just a little piece of puzzle. And sometimes that's the way life feels. We're holding a piece of puzzle. Doesn't make sense. Uh, we don't know where it fits. God, where does this thing go? And we hold it and we think about it and we ponder it. And it doesn't seem to fit anywhere in our life. It just doesn't seem to go anywhere. I, I remember it was more than 20 years ago when my, my nephew, who lives in Nashville, Tennessee, around that area, uh, I was doing a puzzle with him. It was one of these thousand-piece puzzles, it seemed like. It was probably only 24, but, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it was one of those. And, and I didn't know where a piece went. And he looked at me and said, Uncle John, I have the box. <laughs> you know what he was saying to me? He was saying, I have the picture, and if you just set that piece down, I will show you where it goes. And, and so often, we hold these pieces that don't make sense in our life, and we hold them and hold them and hold them, and we don't even know where it goes, but sometimes those pieces don't quite fit yet. Have you ever done a puzzle? Sometimes the piece that you're holding, it's going to take a little more work to figure out where it's going to fit. Now, don't that feel like God? You know, doesn't that feel like God? That sometimes we get all amped up about something. God's just saying, child, just lay it down. Lay it down. Let me take care of it. I have the box. I have the full picture. You can count on me. I know this piece doesn't make sense. I know you're so aggravated, you're so frustrated, you're so irritated, and you don't know, uh, but you, can you just trust me? Let it go. Let that piece go. Count on me, trust me. And one day it's, it's gonna come together and you're gonna know where that piece may fit. I think that's why I love uh, Joseph so much. Here's a young man, 17 years old, sold into slavery. Isn't that a terrible thing to happen? Uh, your family, nonetheless. The people that count on you. I'm the youngest of six boys. And when I think about my caregivers, I didn't think as much about my mom and dad as my brothers. These are the ones 
that sold young Joseph into slavery. He came to help them. They aimed to hurt him. They threw him in a pit. They were going to kill him, but they decided not to. So this warlord comes by, and uh, 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 this uh, warlord, an Egyptian, uh, an Egyptian warlord named Potiphar, uh, went ahead and bought him. And so he lived in Potiphar's house, but God's hand was upon Joseph. And so God blessed whatever Joseph did. And so Potiphar made Joseph the kind of the head of this house. And then his wife saw this young man every day coming in and out of the house. And she starts pining after him, wanting him. And so she daily starts making approaches to him. She's not used to someone saying no to her. You know what they say about a woman scorned. And here he was. He was trying to live a godly, exalt, God-exalting life. And he one day had to run out of there because she grabbed him and had to leave his coat behind. And then she was so angry that she had been scorned by him. She lied against him. And guess where he landed? He landed in prison. Can you imagine? You talk, This isn't fair. He's never going to see his family again. He's in a foreign country. He thinks things are going well, but he's still a slave. He doesn't have his freedom. And then all of a sudden, he gets thrown into prison, even though he is faithful to his servant and to his master. And so he's in prison. I think he's in prison for nearly 12 years. And uh, during that time... There was uh, two people uh, from that served Pharaoh that had dreams. And he said, I'll pray to the Lord, and the Lord gives interpretation of dreams, and I will uh, see what God says. And he comes back and says, this is what God said. Now, are you going to remember me? When you're released, are you going to remember me? They made, he made a promise. Yes, I, I, I am. And so he, he told the interpretation of the dream. The baker was set free. I think it was the baker. Am I right? Uh, the baker was set free, and he forgot. Until much, much later, Pharaoh has a dream. And Pharaoh's dream was uninterpreted. Until, and then the baker said, oh yeah, I remember this guy. When it benefited him, he remembered. Doesn't that sound like life sometimes? <coughs> you're, you're thrown into prison. You're, you're enslaved. You're shackled. It's not of your doing. Somebody else did it. And then... This guy who's trying to benefit himself says, oh, yeah, I remember. And so he interprets a dream. And then Pharaoh sees God's hand when he was a young man of 30 on Joseph. And he oversees uh, the saving of grain because a seven-year drought is coming. And during that seven-year drought, his brothers come up because they're in the need of food. Isn't this amazing? His family would have perished if God hadn't placed him in the place that he was. He was second to Pharaoh. And he had provided, he was providing grain now. And Pharaoh was becoming wealthy because food was the number one thing that people needed. And here's these people, and they didn't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognized them. And then one thing led to another. And he finally revealed himself, and he said, bring my father to me. And so they all come to Egypt, and they're saved. Isn't that amazing? It's an amazing story. And our scripture finds us at the end of the story. Father had died. They had gone back to uh, Canaan to bury him. And then they were back in Egypt. And his brothers start worrying. Now he's going to exact judgment on us. And then they go to him, bow before him, and listen to what he says. You meant this for harm, but God meant it for good. 
for the saving of his people. You know, sometimes God's going to lead you to a crisis of belief where you don't really have a choice. You don't really have an option. You're just like Joseph. But that doesn't mean that, Joseph, that God is not working. God may whisper through pleasure, but he will shout through pain. He won't waste one hurt in your life if you'll hand it over to him. Real quick, three things we learn. Um, I'm just going to list these. Um, lessons that we learn, and I'm going to ask Brian to come up. Number one, God sees the long view, but we only often see and feel the present hurt. Isn't that so true? Number two, God uses disappointments to fulfill his ultimate good. Number three, God uses not only disappointments, but he uses problems to shape our character. He's, he wants to be a part of your life. So I don't know what kind of faith that you can offer to the Lord this morning, but after you hear Brian's story, my prayer is that you can offer, Father, I, I don't believe, but help me in my belief. Help me in my unbelief. Help me to trust in you. Help me to give this hurt to you. Help me to give my future to you. I'm in a crisis of belief, and you're requiring faith and action. Give me the faith to say, other people may mean this for harm, but God means it for good, for the saving of his people. I don't understand where this piece fits, but you do, and I'm giving it to you. Now, my bro brother Brian... Uh, we lived close to each other uh, some years back, and I kept on seeing this guy zipping back and forth for my, I mean, this dude's on the go all the time. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's running around, and he's talking to people. He's on the phone. He's constantly interacting with people. And uh, he's, he went on to college, and now you're getting your master's degree, or you have your master's degree in counseling. Am I correct now? And so... Um, he, he said to me, um, if anybody needs to talk, uh, let them know that I'm, I'm available. And uh, so he's available to you. Now, the other places I kept on seeing him was we, I'd bring our kids to uh, like um, King's Fest. And there's Brian. I'm like, Brian, what are you doing here? He said, well, I'm, I'm the youth pastor in my church. And I'm bringing my kids. And so he kept, he, he was a youth pastor for some years. And, uh, and so God used him in incredible ways. And I just wanted you to get to know Brian. And I wanted you to hear his story, particularly on this Sunday. Because sometimes we face trials and troubles and we think it's for harm. But God means it for good. Brian, can you come on up? I'm going to hold the microphone for Brian. And uh, he's, if you can come up here. I've had numerous people, Brian, say that they, they couldn't be here. And so I have the uh, video. <laughs> so this is the best place to see you. Uh, all right. All right. Good morning, church. And uh, thank you for this honor and, uh, and privilege. This really... Um, this really feels like it gives my life purpose and meaning. Um, I think it was great that John used the puzzle piece as an example this morning because if there's one thing I've been guilty of my entire life is um, trying to take puzzle pieces and cut an edge off and make it fit in place on my own. And... Uh, that started at a very young age. I was very stubborn and a very headstrong kid and very independent. And I was raised in the church by a mother who was very God-fearing, um, raised me to pray, raised me to have respect for the Bible. Um, we had one of those big, huge Bibles that weighed like 
I don't know, as a kid, it felt like it weighed about 250 pounds. And uh, we had to respect it if she ever caught us um, throwing that around or anything like that. We were in the trouble, big trouble. And so I was in the church till about 10 years of age, at which time there was some family problems that went on. And we... Um, the whole family just kind of pulled away from from church and at the same time um, now I want as there's some you know crisis that happened in my life I still want everyone to see how God was con God was continuing to work in my life when there were many times when I was as far away from God as you could be um, and so we as a family pulled away from the church and you're gonna have to switch arms a lot yeah. of that <laughs> anybody who's ever held the phone for me will tell you that your arm gets a little tired um and so um we as a family pulled away from the church and as we pulled away from the church um my life just really went off off the rails um i started getting in a lot of trouble in school my grades plummeted um i finished the eighth grade year with 83 days of detention hall still um i started a food fight my last day of eighth grade um in the cafeteria because i figured there wasn't anything they could do it was the last time they'd ever see me at k collins middle school so <laughs> how are they going to punish me and they made me clean the hallways <laughs> after everybody had cleaned their locker so um i was there for like four hours cleaning the hallway that was a miserable experience but um and so um i'd ran i'd started to hang out with um, people who were introducing me to things like shoplifting um, and that sort of progressed to we would walk through parking lots and when we would walk through parking lots if we saw a car window down we'd stick our head in a car window and take whatever we wanted um, and then that progressed to breaking into houses um, and so on June 24th 1987 when I was on my fifth house that I'd ever broke into. And um, I was I was gonna be pretty good at that life because my father had a job where he was a plant, um, department manager and he would bring home, like he had to um, have covering over his shoes and gloves and hairnet and that kind of thing. And so he brought those home. And so I made sure that the guys that I would break into these houses with, that we were all covered. Shoes were covered, hands were covered, um, hairnets on, so that we didn't leave any kind of evidence behind. So when we were on our fifth house, um, chose my neighbor's house for whatever reason um, and he was at work and I knew he would be back in about 15 I knew he'd be home from work in about 15 to 15 to 20 minutes or so so I stayed watch out on the um, deck that he had and my friend went into the house with his little brother um, to look around. And then when they finished, I was going to go in to look around and we'd see what we wanted in the house and then we'd take what we wanted. And so um, they were in there for about 10 minutes and I heard my name called and I got up and I went to open the screen door. And at about that time, something that... Um, felt like a thousand bee stings concentrated into one small area um, and with the weight of a sledgehammer hit the side of my neck and I um, had no idea what had just happened but immediately I lost the ability to breathe um, I lost all control to stand and I collapsed to the floor um, my friends ran over to me Brian Brian what's wrong get up Brian this isn't funny stop faking and uh, I was like I can't breathe I can't breathe um, and so here's one of those examples where God was working um, my dad 
because of the, the job he had. Had to be CPR certified. And so my dad never in his life had called out for a day of work. Um, and if you know my dad, he never misses work. Um, and so he, um, that day, called out sick. And so um, the guys that I was with ran over to my house and ran inside and got my father, um, and he came out. And, you know, he was a little, um, well, he was a lot. He was panicked because um, I wasn't breathing. And so he started CPR with a neighbor's direction, um, trying to help direct him because he just couldn't remember really what was um, what he had learned. And so he started CPR. Um, the ambulance was called. Um, and so by the time the ambulance got there, um, I was not doing good at all. Um, they loaded me up in the ambulance, took me to the, what used to be Waynesboro Community Hospital. Now it's Summit Square here in Waynesboro. And uh, they had to perform an emergency tracheotomy. Um, my heart had stopped three separate times. They loaded me on to air flight, um, Pegasus, and took me to Charlotte's, Charlottesville. I would be unconscious for like the next 36 hours or so in a medically induced um, coma. Um, upon waking up, I was really panicked. I, I couldn't move. And, uh, and so I just, you know, started um, doing whatever I could to get somebody's attention. It was like 5 a.m. in the morning or something. Um, a nurse came over and she was like, let me go get the doctor. And so the doctor came in. I was 13 years of age, um, and the orthopedic doctor came in and said, um, Mr. Long, um, you have suffered a gunshot wound from a 32 caliber handgun, and it has broke the third and fourth cervical vertebrae in your neck, and your spinal cord's been severed, and so you will never walk again. Um, and you may, our experience in the past is you probably will not even leave the hospital because you're going to require such a high level of care that you always have to be under um, um, really advanced nursing care. And so at 13 years of age, hearing this and always having athletics was my life like sports was everything. I thought I was going to be a professional athlete, you know, and so hearing this at 13, um, my life just seemed to be meaningless. Um, now, here's one of those times when God was providing a puzzle piece. Um, I tested higher on IQ scores after the accident than I did before despite the fact that I just went 25 minutes without oxygen to the brain, um, which is a miracle. I should have been a vegetable. Um, I should have, you know, maybe, um, you know, so that whole thing was another puzzle piece was provided where God was helping to prepare me for my new life ahead. Um, but still stubborn, still had to do things my way. Um, I didn't want to talk to any psychiatrist. Um, I was going to get through this on my own, through my own strength. Um, nobody, you know, I didn't need to talk to them. And they would say, we know you're angry. Please talk to us. And I was, I was really angry. I was angry at God. I was angry with my parents that they wouldn't let me um, because I was on a vent 24 hours a day. So if they would just allow me to come off the ventilator, then that would be it. You know, I wouldn't have to live like this. And so I, w I was going to, I really wanted them to just let me come off the vent. And, and so for seven years or so, 
I just really was bitter, angry. It was always right there below the surface. Um, I didn't accept God. I was angry with God. How could you let this happen? You're all powerful. You're all controlling. You know, I'm 13 years old. Um, and then at 20 years of age, um, our family finds out that my mother, who has totally sacrificed every, everything for me so that I would have every opportunity um, to make something of this life has been diagnosed with breast cancer and her prognosis isn't good. And so now the main caregiver, primary caregiver in my life, her life is in the balance. Um, and so that was just a really, really dark time. And, it, you know, for about three more years, that would go on when I would just not not be in a good place at all. And then there was a day where um, my dad lived right off of Delphine here in Waynesboro. And there was a day where I was seriously contemplating just if I rolled my wheelchair out in front of a tractor trailer, they wouldn't have time to stop. And so, but then I remembered being raised in the church. And I remembered some of the things that I'd heard. Um, and so I was like, well, let me give this God thing this thing my mom had, let me give it a try before I do something drastic that I can't, can't reverse. And Smith Wigglesworth says that, you know, you have to realize how wonderful you can be in God and how helpless you are on your own. Mm -hmm. and, and so I did, I went to church and I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And wow, like overnight prayer, my language changed. I stopped using curse words. I stopped being so bitter and vicious toward people. And uh, God was really starting to change my heart, change my attitude about everything. And so this, it was like, wow, you know, and I'm going to church. I'm getting counseling. Um, I, I learned my functional spiritual gifts. And we decide, hey, um, counseling is a possibility. And so now all of a sudden, um, life seems to have a direction and that I can do something. And um, then I get a home of my own and I move out of my dad's basement and God is moving in all these wonderful directions. Um, I meet this woman who also has a calling um, to work with teenagers and we get married. So now I have almost the entire country song, you know. I, I have a wife, I have a dog, mm -hmm. I have a home. Mm -hmm. Don't have the pickup truck yet, but, uh, um, and so everything, God's just making every puzzle piece fall into place. And then, um, not even at three years of marriage, my wife informs me that, um, she can no longer do this because the quadriplegic, me being a quadriplegic was just too much. And when you're told that um, who you are isn't enough um, for love, for somebody's love, um, it shatters you. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I hadn't learned to totally rely on God. I still wanted to go my own path. Um, I still wanted to 
when you come into that fork in the road, I still wanted to do it Brian's way first, and, and I had to learn that Brian's way didn't work, and then I'd reverse course, you know, and go back the other way. Um, and then, um, you know, that that all led to, um, but, but I was in a church, and I was in a good church, and I, I had the youth, um, I was working with the youth in the church, and that, that really helped, that, that helped get me through that period, and that helped keep me from going too far off um, in the wrong direction. And then, um, you know, I met, I met John, Pastor John in the neighborhood where I lived and met him at King's Fest and stuff. And so, um, and then we found out that our church was closing and, uh, you know, another crisis in life because it was family. And uh, I had this youth pastor position and, um, and so, but here was another time where God had worked because he had introduced me to Pastor John. And so when the, it was available for me to go to church, there was never a question where I was going to go. It was always going to be here. And so all throughout my life with uh, um, coming out of the spinal cord injury with a higher intelligence after no oxygen, and uh, being raised in the church. And uh, there's just been puzzle pieces all along where God's been working and, um, and has led me through these crises one after another. And another quote from Smith Wigglesworth is that um, through great faith, um, great faith is the product of great fights and great testimonies are the result of um, great test and great triumph can only come through great trials. And so um, I think that, you know, our lives are here and uh, we're giving testimonies to um, attest to the greatness of God and uh, if he can take a quadriplegic and um, make him a youth minister and give him a master's degree and um, you know I just think of how much more everybody in the church can do that um, and so you know I just know that almost 30 years ago I really didn't um, medically should have never had a second chance and here I am today 30 years later with a second chance thanks to God and I've been um, very blessed along the way um, but haven't always chose the right path um, and we just need to come to a point where like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse um, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12 verse 9 we have to be willing to call out to Christ and just say your, gr your grace is sufficient for me um, your, your love is sufficient your will is sufficient for my life um, and for when we are weak whether it be weak physically, weak emotionally, weak spiritually. Um, he is strong and, uh, and can get us through anything and uh, actually make life better um, than it was before because on the path I was on, I would have either been dead or incarcerated. Um, with the kind of adrenaline junkie that I was, and the way I just was continuing to ramp up, um, the kind of things I was getting into. Um, so, yeah. So, um, first of all, 
let me hear some appreciation. Give him a hand. Thank God. That, 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 now, 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 bring your bring your claps, bring your hands up to the Lord, and give Him a big hand. Go ahead. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Um, as you're standing, I want to ask you a simple question: What would you like us to do in response to how God meets us? Uh, in our times of weakness, what would you like us to do? I think if anybody's here this morning and you're going through a crisis, whether it be a crisis of faith, a crisis physically, a crisis in your relationships, um, a crisis emotionally, um, crisis in crisis occupationally, um, you're just going through a crisis. Um, this morning would be an opportunity um, to come forth and um, maybe you don't get the second chance that I had 30 years ago. Um, this would be an opportunity for you to come forth to the altar and just choose to take um, God's path to say that yes, I do realize how wonderful I am in God and how helpless I am on my own. And if you're here and you haven't ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, um, don't count on, don't guarantee that you can do it later or that you'll get the second chance because my second chance really medically should have never happened. Um, and so, you know, how many chances do we get? So you hear it. There's the invitation. Uh, one of the invitations is for you to come and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And Keith, if you could, are you going to be playing? Um, then Pastor Michael, if you could come up here. And if you would like to receive Christ as your personal Savior, come up and talk to Pastor Michael. Uh, if you um, are dealing with a crisis and it's time for you to lift up your hands and surrender and say, Father, I need to follow you and give this peace that doesn't make sense. Just give it to you. Um, come on up. You can get on your knees. You can talk to uh Brian, um, he, he's here, and uh, if you would like to stay here. Uh, the third thing I'd like you to consider is if God has spoken to you in a very powerful way, uh, come on up to, to, to Brian and say, Brian, thank you for sharing your story, and uh, it meant a lot to me. And just let him know how God's using um, his story to impact your story. And by the way, that's church. We all have stories, but Jesus makes all the difference in the world. And we, that's the story that we tell. Jesus makes all the difference in the world. And we all have struggles, and it's important to be real, to be open, to be honest, to share our struggles with each other. So let, let, let Brian know. Thank you for encouraging me. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. And uh, you've meant a lot to me. And thank you. And uh, come on up and kneel. I'll be over here on this side. So you can share that story as well with me and, and pray. Thank you, brother.